Second Chronicles chapter 2. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord, a house for his kingdom. So two houses, the temple and Solomon's house, are going to be the two subjects of the beginnings of Second Chronicles. Determined. David prepared, Solomon determined. It's going to be done. I'm going to set my heart to do it. And Solomon told out, that means to count. When you go to a bank, you go to a teller. Three score and 10,000 men to bear burdens. So he counted these men. And burdens to carry things, to do the work. Four score thousand to hew in the mountains. That means go cut down trees. And even maybe rocks. Stone. And 3,600 to oversee them. That's your foreman. That's your bosses. That's the white hats. So Solomon, when he sets these men out, according to the Bible, there are overseers. To have a boss over you is a Bible account. You got to make sure they're going to do the work. And Solomon set to Hiram. Now this gentleman shows up again. He's called Hiram in 1 Kings 5.1 with an I. This is the same man that David goes, hey, I need cedar trees. I need men to do work. Tyre is known for the work. Tyre is known for the men. And now it's carried over to Solomon's reign. And this man of Tyre, the king of Tyre, has a part in building the temple of God. And yet when we come to Ezekiel 28, to the king of Tyre, God addresses that king, a different king, through the devil. So you can have a good nation or you can have a bad nation. Saying, as thou didst dwell, de deal with David my father, and didst send him cedars to build him a house, to dwell therein, David's house. David said, I dwell among cedars and the, the ark is amongst curtains. Even so, deal with me. And that would imply that Hiram did a faithful job, did a faithful service to his father, David, because he goes back and hires him again. David probably spoke about him. David probably liked the work, probably known. Behold, now here's the reason. I build an house to the name of the Lord my God. Notice it says my God. Not the God of Israel, not the God of Abraham, I Solomon says that that is my God I'm building for. Because later on he's going to fall for gods. To dedicate it to him, God. And to burn before him sweet incense. And for a continual showbread. And for the burnt offerings morning and evening. On the Sabbath, on the new moons. Everything the law prescribes, Solomon says we're going to do it. And we need this building to do what God has prescribed where God's going to set his name. The solemn feast of the Lord our God. That would be the Passover. That would be the Feast of Tabernacles. That would be the Pentecost. That would be the day that that would be all the feasts. Of the Lord our God. Now our God. He's the God of Israel. He's the God of the King. And he's the God of Israel. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. What's the ordinance? It's not building the house. No, the frame of verse 4 is the offerings, the Sabbath, the, the, the feast. Israel, we're not bound forever to have this house. We're, we're bound forever for the burnt offering, for the showbread, forever. And that's not happening today. It's going to happen in the, for a period of time in the tribulation period, which at the three and a half years, the devil's going to cut off. And then he's going to sit in the most holy place and proclaim to be God. And then when Jesus Christ comes, the, the temple is going to be there. They're going to be having all the services. David will be there. Solomon will be there. All under Jesus Christ. And probably into life eternal. And the new earth for the Jews. Because the Bible speaks about when John spoke in the book of Revelation. Open up the door. There was the Ark of the Covenant. Open up the door. There's the incense altar. Open up the door, there is the most holy place where not a, a seat is, the mercy seat, but the throne of God, the mercy. 
and not two cherubims, but four cherubims. This temple dwelling that we read about with, with Moses and this temple we're going to read about with Solomon and the temple we, we're reading about now with Ezra, the temple that Jesus Christ walked in, it's in heaven, it's in glory, the new heavens, the new earth, and new Jerusalem. The house which I build is great. Why? For great is our God above all gods. So see, there's a Bible acknowledgement that there are gods. The Bible does not say that there's no gods out there. There are gods. Paul's on the mount. He's on a mountain. He's dedicated to the unknown god. Asterisk, uh, Venus, Mercury, Mars, the planets were named for gods. But there's a god above all gods. And Jesus Christ, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. But who is able to build him a house? Seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Well, I guess that builder, when you read the New Testament, is Jesus Christ and God himself. Notice the three heavens. From the earth to as far as the eagle flies in the Bible, that's man's domain. Attention, world. Uh, the eagle has landed. That's the second heaven. That's where man has never been designed to go. That's the moon. That's the stars. That's Jupiter. That's Mars. That's where man now is adventuring with these spaceships and these rovers and these pictures and these telescopes there is the realm where there are powers and principalities and satan that's the second heaven there's no seven heaven there's a third heaven and then when you get to a, a vast the, the john says it's frozen and above that frozen is an emerald rainbow which is green and there's god's throne with the cherubims and all the angels that's the heaven of all heavens there are three heavens, not seven. And God's all in that. Realize God is here on this earth right now, and though you people worship, you know, he's in the trees, he's in the park bench, he's in the... No, that's not true, but he is all around. God is a spirit. He's contained in all that he has made. But his abode is in heaven. Who, who, who can imitate and copy heaven? And yet the blueprints of David, the blueprints of Moses... I believe Moses went up into heaven as John did and saw everything God left. Maybe David too, I don't know. I won't go that far as far as scripture. But Moses went 40 days and 40 nights up into the mountain and saw God face to face. Cannot contain him. Who am I then that I should build him an house save only to burn sacrifice before him? This house that I'm building, God, God does not live in that house. This house is for the nation of Israel to come and bring their sacrifices. Those feasts, the Day of Atonement, you need one place for that one priest to go twice, once a year, to go into the most holy place, to offer that blood, according to what God is saying, there's only one place you can do that. I have built such a magnificent place for that, for God, but God does not live there, though he's at the mercy seat. Listen, they're going to take this house, and they're going to, they're going to scrape the gold off the doors. One king is going to put all kinds of altars in this place. God's not there when that happens. And we get to think today as Baptist churches, the Tabernacle Baptist Church, the Temple Baptist Church. That's Old Testament. What are you doing preaching again? Oh, we don't, we're not Old Testament, but then you call your church after the temple because God is forsake not, you know, the, the building or the house of God, uh, it says in, in the scriptures. You're misapplying scripture. That church building is not the house of God because today the house of God is the people, the saved one. You think God's going to dwell in your church building when you've got unsaved people there? I don't think so. We worship buildings more than we do God. And this building will become a worship item instead of God. 
Send me now, he's still talking to Hiram, send me now, therefore, a man. A man. Don't you need men? You need one guy in charge of the whole job. We call him a contractor. We go out, hey, you know what? I got all this work to do in my house. I'm going to call up one place. I'm going to call up one company. I'm going to talk to one man. And I'm going to say, you know, if he gives me the price, he's the one who's going to hire the carpenters. He's the one who's going to hire the, the wires. He's the one who's going to hire the plaster. He's the one. He's in charge of the whole project. You get that out of the King James Bible. Call the contractor. Cunning, that means good. That doesn't mean evil, bad. The words have been changed to demeanor them because we are a demeanor people. We're not getting better. We're getting worse. To work in gold, there'll be plenty of gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in iron, and in purple, and crimson. That's the first time crimson shows up. That's red. It's a bright, bloody color red. And blue. And that can skill to grave with cunning men that are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David my father did appoint. I need one man, I need a contractor, I need men under that contractor, right here in Judah, right here in Jerusalem, where I'm going to build that temple. Hiram, I'm going to hire you to hire somebody to do the job for me. Here we go. Send me also cedar trees. They're beautiful, snowy, nice trees. Fir trees. And algum. That's the first time that shows up, trees. You say, what on earth is an algum tree? I've heard a man in a pulpit, all kinds of nonsense. I'll tell you what, exactly what an algum tree is. You ready? It's an algum tree. And I may not even be pronouncing it right. Out of Lebanon. So cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees come out of Lebanon. For I know that thy servants can skill to cut timber in Lebanon. So Tyre is known for their timber work. They're lumberjacks. They're men that can work forestry. They can do such work. And so what does Solomon do? He hires the best. To do the great job for God. He wants the best. And behold, my servant shall be with thy servant. So the Jewish people are going to work with the people of Tyre to build this, this wonderful work. Can you imagine? Can you think about Jonah and Peter if they were to be here with Solomon right now? Who's going to build this temple? Gentiles? Ew! You got a problem, Solomon, because we can't have nothing to do with those Gentiles. Remember, Peter, it is forbidden for us to have anything to do with the Gentiles. Chronicles says that the king, the third king of Israel, hired Gentiles to help build that temple. Jonah ran away from God because I am go I am not going to the Ninevites, and yet here are Gentiles building the temple. You know why? Because there's a prophecy here. There's a prophecy. Look, look, look what it says. Now look what it says. My servant shall be with thy servant. The Jewish with the with the Gentiles, correct? What's the body of Christ today? Is it not made of Jews and Gentiles? Are we not the building? Those in Christ? There it is. You know, trees, cedar trees, fir trees, almond, you know, they have roots. They have cells. They have limbs. They have families. Some produce fruits. Some don't produce fruits. Some are known for their good smells. Some are known for their bad smells. And did not Jesus have a blind man one day? He says, what do you see? He says, I see men as trees walking. So we're to be trees. And when we go to, uh, we're not going to go there, but read Psalms chapter 1 about the good tree and the unhealthy tree. We're to be by the waters of life, the living waters, producing fruit. The sower went out and sowed seed. Some trees are not good for fruit, but there we are right there, the church. My servants, Hebrews, shall be with thy servants, Gentiles. 
Peter told God, oh, not so, Lord. He called it unclean. This temple's not unclean. God's going to, when, when Solomon dedicates it, he says, hey, man, glory to God. When Daniel looks to the no temple no more, I'll listen to the prayer. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When Daniel looked out his window and looked east, could he look to a building? No, he looked to Jerusalem. So forget about worshiping the building. Uh-huh. When Solomon said, this place where we're in the enemy's hands and we have forbidden, forgotten you, Lord, we have disobeyed your commandments and we are not. When we look to this place and we lift up our prayers and repent, Lord, look, and God said, yeah, I will. Daniel does that. Gets in trouble, ends up in lion's den. But he didn't look to the, to the building, he looked to the place. It's not the building. It's to the place. Where is our place? It's on a tree, isn't it? Isn't there a cedar tree, an almond tree, and a fir tree? Why are there three trees? Because there were three trees on the, on the place, not the building, where Jesus Christ suffered and died. How's that? Some say a dogwood tree. I don't know. I don't see a dogwood tree in the Bible. If I would have my personal opinion, I would say an oak, but that's my personal opinion. But there, look so much at eight. You know what eight is in the Bible? That number eight, first eight, a new beginning. What's a new beginning? The Jews and the Gentiles. Paul says that's a great mystery. Why? Because Jews don't get along with Gentiles. And Gentiles didn't get along with Jews. But now we're one body. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Romans chapter 10. You're to be a fruitful tree, planted by the living waters, Psalms chapter 1. When John the Baptist comes, he says, you're a tree against the roots. The axe, the axe is laid through. You're a bunch of dead trees. We're going to cut you down and cast you off in the fire. What's that fire? It's hell. You know, when you put a log in a fire at a campsite or, fire, or a fireplace anywhere, you know that log is never consumed completely? Go there three days later, go where, where you had that fire, and there's a bunch of ashes. That log is not consumed utterly. And as a man goes into hell as a, as a tree, a type of tree, he just burns and burns and burns and burns. The Bible says trees are clap their hands, those that go to glory. So much in that one verse. Even to prepare me timber in abundance. You need a lot of wood. For the house which I am about to build shall be wonderful great. That wonderful great and that great verse 4, today are people, and look how wonderful our church is. Now how about wonderful God is? I can assume with all the storms we've had in the, mid, in the Midwest, since America began, since we did the Louisiana Purchase, I can assume that some of those floods and some of those tornadoes have destroyed church buildings. I, I can almost assume that. I can almost assume somewhere in America, within the history of America, the church buildings have been destroyed because of weather, because of other people. So what? You don't meet as a meeting somewhere else because your building's gone? No, we have a great, wonderful God. We meet Wednesdays in a gazebo out in the open field when God comes in and joins us and we're open to the word of God. We don't have stained glass windows. We don't have walls. We have a roof. Thank God for the roof if it rains. And we have not needed that, that roof for rain yet. And behold, I will give to thy servants. I'm going to pay them. You pay. The hewers that cut timber, that would be uh, lumbermen, 20,000 measures of beaten wheat. What's the difference there? There's no husk and there's no chaff. What the wheat I'm going to give you is wheat that you use for food. No waste. No waste. 20,000 measures of barley. And I don't think they're going to turn that into alcohol. They got a barley bread. And what I'm told, I don't think it tastes too well from what I've been told. They could. 20,000 baths of wine. Grape juice. And 20,000 baths of oil. Olive oil. That's what I'm going to pay you for all the work. That's the end of Solomon. Hiram. Then Hiram the king of Tyre answered in writing. 
which he sent to Solomon, because the Lord has loved his people, look at that, his people, the Jews, Israelites, he has made thee king over them. What if some people didn't like Solomon? God made him king. I don't like the president of the United States. Well, God made him the president. He may uh, not talk about the president, president. Ooh, okay, I say that three times. I'm talking about any president. Even though they've given themselves to the devil, God still allowed him to be in that Oval Office. The queen, the king, and whoever. Hiram said, moreover, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Happy. Here's a Gentile praising God. Are there not Gentiles today that praise God? The Lord God of Israel, not the Lord God of America, not the Lord God of England, not the Lord God of China, not the Lord God of the Lord God of Israel. You got to have the Jew who came of the tribe of Judah, of Mary who was a virgin, where the Jews rejected Jesus. He came unto his own Jewish, and his own received them not. Fine. Paul said, one day, okay, fine. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Peter said, no, Lord, I can't do that. God's like, you better go. And then the Gentiles got it. And then the, the Ethiopian eunuch got in. And he went home praising God. Pictures the church age. And there is no building yet. There is absolutely no building. Everyone is just thanking, praising God. That made heaven and earth. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hiram didn't go to the public school system. Hiram does not believe in the Big Bang. You know, there's a possibility we may see Hiram in eternity on the new heavens and new earth or the new Jerusalem. Oh, not new, new Jerusalem. He believes the Lord God of Israel. He believes the heaven and earth, and he wants to bless the Lord. He might stand at the great white throne judgment, open the books. Yeah, his name is in the book, isn't it? He don't believe in evolution. Who has given to David the king a wise son, endued with prudence and understanding. Well, when we look at chapter 1, verse 10, he says, give me now wisdom and knowledge. There is no understanding mentioned. But in the words of Hiram, he says, Solomon has understanding. But Solomon does not have the understanding of God because when he gets married to these women, he goes away from God to small gods. And the understanding of the Bible is your relationship to God. Solomon has built the house of God, and he will build other houses, other temples, other altars to other gods. Not understanding the God. That might, wait, that might build a house for the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And now I have sent a cunning man, endued with understanding of Hiram, my father. The son of a woman... She's called a widow in 1 Kings 7.13. The daughters of Dan. Dan is a weird tribe, almost type of the Antichrist. In Exodus 38.23, Ahoyab is of the tribe of Dan, and God points him out to build that tabernacle of Moses. Uh, Exodus 38.23. Okay, 1 Kings 7.13. She's called a widow woman of Dan. Dan is missing from the 144,000. Now why is he... And Dan is a little bit away from Tyre. Dan is more north. And his father was a man of Tyre. Uh-oh, mixed marriage. He had a Jewish mother. He had a Gentile father. And look at the knowledge he has. Do you know someone else in the Bible mentioned by name? Almost the same classification? Timothy. 
His mother was a Jewish, his father was Greek, and he had great knowledge through Paul. Interesting. And his mother and grandmother. And his mother and grandmother. The son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. I don't think he mentions what, what tribe he's of. His father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and in silver, in brass, in iron, in stone, and in timber, and in purple and blue and fine linen. That's everything Solomon asked for in verse 7. But add to fine linen. And in crimson. Also to grave any man manner of graving. So Hiram obeys Solomon exactly to what Solomon wants. And to find out every device, that's the first time that word shows up, device. To find out every device which shall be put to him. I would probably, tool, material, Anything that came into his hand for that building, he would learn how to do or knew how to do. With thy cunning men, that's, that's the Hebrews, and with the cunning men of my Lord David, thy father, there's the Jew. So the Jews are not stupid. They just need help. And Hiram acknowledges your, your people, the children of Israel, the children of God. You... <coughs> You're knowledgeable, you're skilled, but you need help. Here I am. The Jewish people have got the scriptures, but they need help in the scriptures. You need somebody to go to the Jewish people and say, Hey, the Messiah has come. Let me open your Old Testament and show you. You need to know what the gospel is. Though the scriptures were given to the Jewish people, Paul says, Pray for the children of Israel. Witness the children of Israel. Show them. Now therefore, the wheat and the barley, the oil and the wine, which my Lord has spoken of, let him send unto his servants. Okay. Yep, I accept your money. I accept your deal. I will give you wood. I will give you labor. I will give you the men. And verse 10, I will give, and that will be what you pay me. It's a signed, sealed document. It's in writing. He sent it in writing. Verse 11. And we will cut wood out of Lebanon as much as thou shalt need. And we will bring it to the we will bring it to thee in floats by the sea to Joppa. And thou shalt carry it up to Jerusalem. So have you ever seen those where they're floating wood down the river? In the lumber camps, here it is in the Bible. The easy way to transplant this wood is let it go by the river. And when we come to Jerusalem, you're going to carry it from Jerusalem up to where you need to build. And Solomon numbered all the strangers, Jew, uh, Gentiles, that were in the land of Israel. After the numbering wherewith David his father had numbered them. That would be 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21. Now, why does not the angel Lord show up and say, okay, Solomon, you want to be three years of this, three days of this, and three months of that? Because the purpose of Solomon's numbering, there is a purpose. I need to know how many men I have for the labor camp, for the labor work. I need to know how many skilled people I have. I want to know how many men that can work gold, how many men can do silver, how many iron workers I have, how many men can cut you. I got to know. And when you got that contract, he comes to the house, he looks at your house and says, well, you know what? We're going to need this amount of sheets of plywood, so I'm going to need this amount of roofers. I'm going to need this amount of electricians for the job. But your job only requires one plumber. So when he comes and shows up, he goes, why do you got three plumbers here? That, that, that's more than what I need. Two of you got to go home. We can't shortchange the work of God, and we can't underchange the work of God need to know and they were found a hundred and fifty thousand and three thousand six hundred a hundred and fifty three thousand six hundred gentiles and he set three score and ten thousand of them to be 
bearers, that's the first time that word shows up, a burden. Now we have addition to verse 2. Solomon told out 3,000, 10,000 men to bear burdens, four score thousand to hew the mountain, and there's more. After he deals with Hiram, after Hiram sends him the paper, after Hiram said, this is what we need to do, we've got more to do the job. Four score thousand to be hewers in the mountain, and 3,600 overseers, bosses, to set the people to work. So what we have here is we have the paperwork for the temple. The paperwork is, I need a contractor. Contractor, this is says this is what we need to be done. This is how many men we need for the job. It's good. All right, I will give you this if you do the job. Okay, I'm going to send you this amount of men. I'm going to send you this materials. I accept what you're going to give me. Here's the documentation. And then the next chapter, Lord willing, we're going to set the bill. It's what happens when you do anything with a house building project. Whether you're building a new place or you're doing work to your house. You come to agreement between two parties, what is needed, what's not needed, and the payment. And then boom, next starts the construction. 